Ludwina. She was born in Scheidum in Holland in 1380. So her mother apparently was at a Palm Sunday mass in the local church. Suddenly she got rushed home to give oh. birth to Ludwina. She had to go home to have the baby while the Passion was being sung, which is, you know, deeply there. And uh, one of the sources says, this was an omen of the suffering Ludwina was to endure. Oh, great. Yeah. Cool. It's great. Cool. It's great. By seven or eight, she was already greatly devoted to the image of Our Lady in the church of okay. Scheidham. Mm -hmm. Apparently she was a beautiful and intelligent girl. By the age of 12, many men wanted to marry her, which is great, <sighs> which is great. Fucking hell. Marry. No. Mary wanted no, to. Wanted no. to. But she declared her intention to remain a virgin, as I think a 12-year-old should. A couple of years later, she's 15. She goes skating, ice skating with her friends. Either she was a klutz and fell, or more likely maybe someone pushed her over on the ice. So she fell really hard, broke a rib, and probably banged her head quite hard as well. Oh. Probably. But that's a little less clear. It's very clear she broke a rib on her right-hand oh, side. That's, that's no good. It's not great. The rib did not heal. And no matter what medical intervention was applied, it just wouldn't make any difference. Let's guess that there's something else going on. I don't know what you're saying. One biographer ominously declares, this was the beginning of her martyrdom. Ah, uh, great. It's going to be great. Because obviously the way that God works is not through, you know, the Romans stringing up the wrong people or what, no. or, or tempting you with the lions and shit like that. But no. the God, is, God is like ice skating. This, this Fell over this, ice skating, this, broke this, a rib, you're fucked, mate. <laughs> I mean, holy. Yeah. All yeah. the way. I'm going to torture you into holiness. <laughs> like, I mean, God, come I, on. I, I feel like you've ruined the story. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, where, where, where is your big sky guy? Come on. Yeah. So she became progressively paralyzed. Oh, God. She soon became unable to walk except without a, which she needed a stick or a crutch and her body would slowly deteriorate. I'm going to do a little bit of science and say it's more than a broken rib. So from about 20, she was confined to her bed and she When did she have the accident? 15. Oh. So she was limping around on crutches oh, so and stuff. Oh, so progressively got worse yep. and the, yep. the, the, the yep. ice skating was the moment. Yeah. So, yeah, from about 20 she was confined to bed and she basically remained in bed for the rest of her life. And, no, that wasn't two or three years. That was quite a few years. Uh, but paralysis kind of sounded like the best bit. Because <laughs> soon after her injury, gangrene began to set in and spread, according to at least a few sources, across her entire body. At 16, an abscess burst and fluids, quote, came up through her mouth with the vomiting. <laughs> With the vomiting. With the vomiting. She had three large open wounds on her body and maggots began to eat her rotting flesh. Oh. <laughs> the maggots came out of the wound in her stomach and um, they put a plaster of fresh wheat and honey on it to sure. draw the maggots towards that rather to stop them feeding on her. Yeah, well, sure. Which it's makes good. sense. A little bit of brie. A chablis. <laughs> sure. The maggots will like that more. We'll pair it. We'll just put some, yeah, yeah. a little, a little like, picnic next to your stomach. A bit of ice cream for afters. <laughs> She soon began to feel happiness in her pains, recognizing in sure. them God's will and her special vocation. Yeah, okay. So she got quite quickly to a point where she ate almost nothing. When her body got to the point where she could no longer tolerate that, she drank a bit of water from the river, which is not a good idea. Yeah. And apparently, according to a number of sources, she survived on the Eucharist. The, the, the little wafer bread. A bit of sourdough and some, I don't know, Pinot Bois. Survived on the Eucharist. Also, she was completely unable to sleep for days, weeks, and maybe months, like completely not sleeping. Sleep was out. Surely she is just passing in and out of delirium, like with this level of pain and this level of rotting of the body. Religious ecstasy. Low, low, or, or, yeah, yeah, religious ecstasy or delirium. I would imagine. Also talks of how Lidwinia shed. Oh. Skin. Oh. Bones. B bones? Parts of her intestines. Bones. Some stories suggest she may have puked some bone out. How does a bone get in the puke passageway? Like I, I don't know. I, I, apart from the gross out here, like like I, and I'm there just, is that. There I'm is just that, being yeah. science here. Here, yeah. Like how? how how do you get foot the, bones connected to the tummy bone? No. How do you suddenly pass a bone? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I get a bone falling off you if you're rotting that badly. Oh my god! But throw up a bone. <laughs> Fuck. Sometimes you throw up, and it's it's a little bit of a throw up. Sometimes it, it you feel a, fat, a powerful purge. And oh and yeah, you know you know that way you, you get feel a little, the toenails. Coming you get out. a little bit proud of something that's that horrific, but that amount of like if you throw up a bone, I'll be like. Fuck yeah. Well, fucking I threw up a bone. That's a bit of finger. Like, I don't know how it happened. Like, no, I didn't need it. I threw up hard. My right pointy finger only has one knuckle. Lung. Yeah. I don't know if she was proud. 
Oh, I'm just saying you've got to take your wins. I'm you not do, saying. you do, you do, you do. She could hardly speak because of the cleft in her lower lip and chin. As well, she could not see out of her right eye and her left eye was so weak that it was painful to see any light, so she often had to stay in the dark. <laughs> but it's okay. God wanted it. Because when God slams a huge door in your nuts... It just opens a can of lemonade. He opens a tiny little crack in a window because he, quote, rewarded her with a wonderful gift of prayer and also with visions. Mm. So stop your whinging. About 25, she began to experience ecstasies, which continued throughout her life. Well, that's better than not. It is. So many miracles apparently took place at her bedside and she gained a reputation as a healer and a holy woman. Oh, well, what else are you going to do? Um, she was also, uh, quote, credited with many acts of curing and charity, providing abundant food and nourishment to the needy that miraculously multiplied or lasted longer than expected. Oh, cool. Fuck knows how that worked. I have no idea. That's just a comment. That no, was but made sometimes you make a dinner that lasts longer than you expect. By the age of 40, apparently she was happy and, and – <laughs> Well, she was She's happy. 40. By 40, yeah. She was happy to be able to receive the communion at least a number of times a week. During her last few years, she could not move anything except her head and her left arm, and she always had to lie on her back. Oh, my God. The human body, though. It's a miracle, isn't it? Like, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. So at some point in her life, it's not really clear when, but at some point she was shown a vision of a rose bush, mm -hmm. and she was told, when this shall be in bloom, your suffering will be at an end. Ah. So it's the spring of the year 1433, and she's okay. 52, 53. Okay. She apparently cries out, I see the rose bush in full bloom. So on the morning of Easter day, which she was apparently in deep contemplation, and she beheld in a vision Christ coming towards her to administer the sacrament of extreme unction, I'm not getting, just some everyday unction. No, it's fully no fear. He's got his sunglasses on. He's, he's, he's fully yep. sick. He's like, I'm going to extremely unction you. And she died in the odour of great sanctity. <laughs> Not my words. So basically from 15 to 53, she suffered every imaginable pain. She was one sore from head to foot and greatly <laughs> emaciated. What a life. <laughs> Why the fuck am I talking to you about her? It's a question. Well, she was beatified or canonized, not just for the patron saint of ice skating, but also the patron saint of, depending on who you read, chronically ill or people in chronic pain. Oh. But the real reason she came to my attention was because she thought to have been one of, if not the first documented case of multiple sclerosis. What? I know. Enter science and medicine. Historical texts, they list this string of maladies and problems that she had going on and has heaps in common with a lot of the characteristics of multiple sclerosis. So when it came on, so mid-teens, okay. how yep. long it lasted, okay, for fucking ever, and the yep. kind of the course and nature of much of the disease, paralysis, the eye problems, etc. Okay. Very MSE. So she may have actually been the first example that's been recorded. So when you add these, the, the posthumous diagnosis of MS, relatively plausible, so maybe it's been recorded since the 14th century. Just to confirm, uh, MS, like a neurodegenerative sort of mm. condition, it's about, mm. it's about nerves. Yeah, and the suspicion is when you go back and read through it is maybe she fell over because she was starting to get these these paralysis or, yeah. or, or you know, issues. It's the reason she I think, I think it's a fascinating thing to, be, to, to think about conditions – that uh, that you know we've lived through, and we have so much better documentation mm. now to go back and go. Okay, so what, what might they look like in in yeah. early literature where they're looking for different things? So, morals of the story for me: historical tomes with lists of symptoms may be open to a hint of interpretation, but they could also be indicators of you know what's yep. what's going on. You don't really have to work very hard for medicine to reduce any spiritual experience to a disease state. Yeah. Okay. But more to the point, there's a patron saint of literally fucking everything. For example, I'll give you three more. St. Drausinius, who's the patron saint of invincible people. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big call. Big call. Why the fuck do they need one? St. Genesius, which sounds like a Star Wars villain, patron saint of actors, lawyers, barristers, clowns, comedians, converts, dancers, people with epilepsy, musicians, printers, stenographers, and victims of torture. Ooh. <laughs> Like I want my patron saint to be focused on me and not also talking to a clown. Like I, I, <laughs> I like I, I want you. I'm being tortured here, buddy. Like don't don't. I don't mean to be offensive, but were you just talking to a clown? Would you, I mean, really? Like like don't care about a clown if you're caring about torture people. <laughs> Finally, Saint Isidore, patron saint of computers and the internet. <laughs> What did you do? I was so good at my tweets. I 
I was the greatest troll ever. Yeah. Like, how are you the patron saint? Or you, you why do you a troll to death? There is like. information and things involved. So basically, I'd like to say now, I think we have new spiritual sponsors. The Wholesome Show has new spiritual sponsors. Which one? St. Isidore Day, of course, because of the internet and stuff. Oh, yeah. With the assist of St. Lawrence and St. Genesius. Comedians? Comedians, and of course... Uh, where's science? Clowns, comedians, com- uh, fuck science, we don't do science. science. Oh my God. Science is in the background. Oh my God. So there you go, saints, multiple sclerosis, we now have religious backing. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>